Good morning. It is good to be with you this morning. Whether you are here in the sanctuary or watching from home or, or downstairs in Founders Hall with young children, I am so glad that you're here. As we gather here this morning, let me, let me ask all of you a question. Do you ever get so frustrated with the world? Do you ever get so frustrated with the world and all of its problems that you are tempted just to stop caring? I, I sometimes am. I am sometimes tempted to say, no more. The problems are too big. I am too small. There is nothing I can do. I should just focus on my own well-being and my family's well-being and forget about all the rest. When we are tempted to shout, no more, it's religious community that reminds us we are not alone. It's religious community that reminds us there are many others who care too. It is religious community that reminds us we can't accomplish everything we want, but there are things we can do together to make things better. Come, my friend with our hearts open to both the challenges and the possibilities that this new day and this new week bring, with our hearts open to all that is within us and between us and all around us that inspires, sustains, redeems, and transforms us. Come, let us worship together. Thank mm -hmm. you.
disappoint, we leave a mess, we die, but we don't. We disappoint, in turn, I guess, forget the we won't. Like fathers, like sons. No more giants. Flaming chalice is a symbol of the Unitarian Universalist tradition, the liberal religious tradition to which this congregation belongs. I invite you to stand for the lighting of our chalice. And if you have a chalice at home, I invite you to light it with me at this time. you please join me in reciting the words on the screen. As we kindle this flame, we recommit ourselves to the mission of this congregation to build a Unitarian Universalist community that transforms lives and empowers people to serve the world. May the light of this flame be welcoming to all who seek a liberal religious home. Please be seated. Our opening hymn this morning is number 123, Spirit of Life. Because of the possible risks posed by COVID-19 and by congregational singing, we won't sing together this morning, but Linda and Alexandra will sing for us.
Good morning and welcome to UUFR. If you're visiting us for the first time this morning, either in person or online, I offer you a special welcome. Here at the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Raleigh, we are intentionally inclusive, liberally religious, and actively serving the common good of our shared world. Whoever you are, and wherever you are on your own religious journey, you are welcome here. As Unitarian Universalists, we seek wisdom and inspiration from many sources, but affirm our own individual conscience and, and experience as the best authority for our beliefs. We believe the purpose of religion is to help us live most fully in this lifetime and make the world a better place. And we believe religious community helps us do that. And we hope that you might join us in one of these many efforts. If you are visiting us for the first time in person and haven't already done so, I invite you to stop by the visitor stand after the service, which is right outside um, the sanctuary doors. If this is your second visit, please stop by again to get a more permanent name tag. If you're visiting us for the first time online, I invite you to fill out our visitor form at www.uufr.org slash visitor form. If you do this, you'll start receiving our weekly e-newsletter. I hope all of you will read through the chalice you received by email on Thursday about everything that's happening here at UUFR. I'd like to highlight a few items. After today's worship service, we're having another picnic and kickball game in Poland Park. We'll be at shelter number five, which is the same place we were at last time. If you didn't pack a picnic lunch, that's okay. There's food and drink available for sale in the park. As more of us start attending UUFR again in person, we need more volunteers for many of our events and activities. For example, every Sunday we have visitors here at UUFR and we need greeters, ushers, and welcome stand volunteers to make those folks feel welcome. This is also a great way to get to know people. Whether you are a longtime member or new to UUFR, if you'd like to help with this, please visit www.uufr.org slash volunteer or talk to Annie Wheelis, our Congregational Life Coordinator. We are also tentatively planning to resume programming for all ages in January and need lots of volunteers for that, not only parents. Tris Shagnon, our family minister director, will be holding an information session next Sunday, October 10th, after our worship service for any adults who would like to learn more about our family ministry program and find out how you could help on Sunday mornings or at other times. For those of you who are here in person this morning, our social hour will be outside our front doors. Please do your best to spread out. For everybody online, please feel free to join us for an online social hour immediately after the service. There are instructions about how to do this on our website. As we meet and greet each other this morning, please refrain from shaking hands or hugging, but feel free to wave, bump elbows, or bow. For everybody at home, please do so using the chat function on your screen.
There's going to be lots of time to continue those conversations during social hour. This is the time in our service when we acknowledge some of the joys and the sorrows of our community. Anyone is invited to email a joy or sorrow to joysandsorrows at uufr.org before 9 a.m. on Sunday. And anyone is also invited to light a candle and fill out one of our cards. Folks at home may also share your joy or sorrow using the chat function on your screen. I'll share the joys and sorrows that I received now. A memorial service for a longtime UUFR member, Mary Fulmer, who died on September 24th at the age of 95, will be held this Saturday, October 9th, at 11 a.m. here at UUFR. Anastasia Brown shares the joy that he was approved for a scholarship through work to further his career. The Meisners are enjoying a family beach weekend at Emerald Isle, North Carolina, in a delayed celebration of Jerry's 70th birthday. They are grateful to Bruce and Margie Lynch for offering their lovely beach home in a previous UUFR auction. Sylvia Carter and Tom Hawkins had a particular joy last week. Sylvia has been referred to by her doctors as a zebra patient because of the uniqueness of her health situations. So it was with mythic delight that they learned this week that three zebras had escaped from a wildlife farm and were roaming the fields and highways of Prince George's County, Maryland, and adjoining counties. Sylvia and Tom took great pleasure to learn that a group of zebras are referred to collectively as a dazzle. Sylvia feels that she is one of them. As we reflect on these joys and sorrows, and all those joys and sorrows and fears and hopes of our own lives, let's be together now for a time of stillness and silence, opening ourselves up to that spirit between us, amidst us, that call, is called by many names but known to every human heart, and leads to a fuller experience of life. After the silence, Linda and Alexandra will sing hymn number 123, Spirit of Life, for real this time. But now let's be together in stillness and in silence.
Much of what we do at UUFR is only possible because of the generous financial gifts so many of you provide. This morning, instead of passing our collection baskets, if you would like to make a donation, please come forward and leave your donation in one of the baskets up front. It's also possible to give using one of the methods posted on our screen. Please be generous and thank you. reading this morning is from the Gospel of Matthew. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, You are accursed. Depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me, naked, and you did not give me clothing, sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they will also answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Justice dawned 
Thank you, Alexandra. Thank you, Linda, both of you, for your gifts of music to us this morning. When I first moved to Wake County two years ago and began serving as this congregation's lead minister, I expected to feel like more of an outsider. I had never lived in the South before, and I didn't know what to expect. The truth is, I didn't feel very much like an outsider at all because it seems like most of the people I have met, both inside this congregation and in the wider community, are from someplace else. How many of you are from someplace else? Uh-huh, yeah. Of course, not everybody is from someplace else, but a lot of folks are. I know that in North Carolina, as a whole, just under half the population was born in another state, and I expect in Wake County, those numbers are, are higher. Some of us who came from other places came to attend school and never left. Many came for jobs. Quite a few, at least in this congregation, came to be closer to adult children and their families who came for jobs. Some just came to retire to a place that does, doesn't get quite as much snow as Buffalo or isn't quite as expensive as San Francisco. When my family and I moved to this area, we ended up in Cary because when I traveled here in the spring of 2019, during the 72 hours, I had to find a house. The one that I found met most of my criteria. It was good school for my son, a fenced-in backyard for the dog, close to H Mart for my wife, and within my price range. I wanted a shorter drive to work, but one can't have everything. My priorities came a little bit lower than the dog's priorities. So. <laughs> Describing my move to California, I kidded with you a few weeks ago that I came for the barbecue and stayed for the pandemic. <laughs> but I don't want to give the wrong impression. I like living here, and I'm glad I came. Raleigh and other Wake County communities are nice places to live. Seems like a lot of other people have the same idea. Wake County is, is one of the fastest growing counties in the United States. I looked at one list that said it's within the top five, maybe even the top three. Do you know how, on average how many people arrive here every day? 62. 62 new people every day. And this is nothing new. Wake County has been growing steadily from about 1959 when the RTP was established. The truth is, this growth, this growth makes life more interesting, even better for many of us. More people mean better schools. More restaurants, more interesting restaurants, better shopping, more arts, more music. My wife and I went to the Bluegrass Festival yesterday. That was a lot of fun. More parks, even better sports. All the things that a thriving metropolitan area has to offer. I have found that dying Rust Belt cities rarely have good symphonies. 
Wake, Wake County's growth has made life better for this congregation. Look around you this morning. For those of you physically present this morning, look around you at this beautiful, beautiful sanctuary. I have been in a lot of Unitarian Universalist sanctuaries. I have been in sanctuaries so ugly. <laughs> I have been in, congregation, in congregations that had sanctuaries that were so ugly, the congregation had an extra long period of silence <laughs> just so people could keep their eyes closed a little bit longer. <laughs> ugly as sin. I've also been in a lot of beautiful sanctuaries. And let me tell you, this one is among the more beautiful. Why is this congregation able to have such a beautiful sanctuary? This congregation was founded in 1949. And if you look at its membership numbers, its membership numbers really closely track the population growth of Wake County. If Raleigh hadn't grown at all, this congregation might still be worshiping in a small little house over on Hawthorne Street. It wouldn't need such a large sanctuary, and it certainly couldn't have afforded one. So for many of us, this area's growth has been good. For many of us, but not for all of us. A rising tide has not lifted all boats and seems to be sinking a few. How many of you saw the front page story in last Sunday's News Observer about the College Park neighborhood in Southwest Raleigh, written by our very own Josh Schaefer? How many? Yeah, quite a few of you saw that. The article tells the story of, of Tezel and J.C. Perry, who have lived in that neighborhood, that College Park neighborhood, for 53 years, but are watching as the neighborhood they once knew disappears, as so many of the neighbors they knew for decades disappear. It was once a predominantly black neighborhood, a part of Raleigh's segregated history. But soaring property tax rates means that even middle-class black families that live there are having a hard time staying. Perry family saw their property taxes increase 30% last year. And some neighbors saw their property taxes go up even more than that. House prices have increased so much and affordable rentals have disappeared. So people who grew up in the neighborhood who would like to move back to be closer to family and friends have almost no hope of doing so. And this isn't just affecting families individuals and families. It's also affecting communities. Look around at this sanctuary again and think about the thriving community that we share here. When I talk to pastors of some congregations in Southeast Raleigh, they talk about so many people in their congregations moving away because they can't afford to live close by anymore. Some of them don't know whether their congregations will survive. Meanwhile, over in Cary, where I live, the town doesn't have as much of a problem with affordable housing disappearing. Why? It's never had much affordable housing. In part because the town does very little to support it. Cary is the seventh largest municipality in the state of North Carolina. But unlike other municipalities in Wake County and across the state, it does little to support affordable housing. Raleigh, Durham, and Chapel Hill have recently passed housing bonds to support affordable housing. Cary has not. I just recently learned that the elementary school closest to where I live was burned down. It was burned down in 1963 when Cary community leaders were among the first in Wake County to take steps to desegregate schools. I didn't know that history. They were willing to do the right thing 
even in the face of very hateful opposition. Six years later, barriers to diversity may look different than they did in 1963, but when a town does little to, afford, to support affordable housing, it's just another way of some people saying, we don't want people like that living here and going to school with our children. I think it's time carry leaders recommit themselves to doing the right thing again in order to create a more diverse, more inclusive community. So I, I bet some of you are asking now, well, is there anything we can do? It's funny, you should ask. <laughs> As many, but probably not all of you know, this congregation participates in one way, a multiracial, multicultural, multilingual coalition of more than 40 churches, mosques, synagogues, and other religious and civic organizations that advocate for the common good here in Wake County. One of the issues that One Wake has been working on since its founding is affordable housing. In One Wake, with participation from people here in this congregation, has recently put forward two proposals. First, One Wake is advocating a property tax relief program for low income, for long time, low income homeowners in Raleigh. Second, One Wake is advocating a penny on the dollar property tax increase in Cary that would go towards affordable housing. It would cost the average homeowner $35 a year. I recently took my wife and my son out to lunch and it was a lot more than $35. Probably because I ordered the raw oysters, but that's another story. So we're talking about an increase that is less than a lunch. So on October 21st, coming up in just a few weeks, One Wake is hosting a gathering on the property tax relief program between elected city officials in Raleigh and its residents. This gathering is going to be a hybrid gathering, meaning it will be possible to attend either in person or online. Most folks will probably attend online. The next month, on November 11th, one Wake is hosting a gathering between Cary Town Council members and candidates and residents. At each of those gatherings, One Wake will be asking our elected leaders to support these proposals. So will they? That depends a lot on all of you. How many of you are willing to show up? Many of you remember that a year ago, One Wake hosted a similar gathering. Overall, more than 2,000 people attended by Zoom. More than 2,000 people attended by Zoom, including more than 200 of you, 200 people affiliated with this congregation. At that gathering, we were advocating around issues related to the downtown south development. Did we get everything we wanted? Sadly, no. But you never do. Did we have some success? Yes, we did. We made a real difference in people's lives. We made a difference in protecting some vulnerable neighborhoods in, in Southeast Raleigh. So I hope you will try to make a difference again. All you have to do is show up. Numbers make a difference. Elected leaders rarely pay attention to candlelight vigils. As I've said before, no matter where you stick the lid into the candle, They, they rarely show up when a minister and 12 little old church ladies show up in a room. But when 2,000 people show up, do they pay attention? Yes, they do. When 2,000 people show up, elected leaders pay attention. For any, for any of our youth who are here today or watching at home, I hope that you will show up at one of these events. You may not be old enough to vote in the next municipal elections, but I bet each of you have a friend who's old enough to vote, and you might be old enough to vote in the election after that. 
And this past summer, my family and I have visited the International Civil Rights Museum in Greensboro. And I was surprised to learn about the critical role that high school students, the critical role that high school students played in the efforts to racially integrate the Woolworths lunch counter, lunch counter in that city in the 1960s. None of you is too young to start making a difference. This world belongs to each of you as much as it belongs to all of us. And your time to step up is now. You don't even have to put down your phone. You can attend either one of these meetings on your phone. For the 136 members, friends, and visitors of this congregation who live in the fine, fine town of Cary, I especially hope you will attend the Cary event. I'm going to ask something of all of you who are here this morning, and I know this is going to be a little bit of a stretch, stretch for you. I'm not only asking you to show up, I'm asking you to find one person, one other person in your life who is not already affiliated with this congregation, and ask them to show up. I bet you know somebody in your life who might do that. There is a lot going on in our world right now. Congress is squabbling over two infrastructure bills. State leaders are squabbling over the state budget. The sad truth is that each of us have relatively little power to affect the outcome of these squabbles. But we have so much more power to affect what happens at the local level. Let's use this power to create the kind of world that we want to live in. If you are here in person this morning, there will be a table right outside the sanctuary after the service with more information about both of these events. If you are watching at home online, there is a box on the front page of our website right now. You need to sign up to attend either one of these events, so please do so. But why should you? Not just because I'm telling you, I hope. For some of you, it may come down just to a simple sense of compassion and fairness. You don't want to see people who have lived in neighborhoods for decades to be driven out of their homes. You don't want to see black families that were once forced to live in certain neighborhoods because of this city's ugly history of segregation now be forced to move someplace else just because those neighborhoods are suddenly more popular with white people. You don't want the woman who bags your groceries at the Publix in Cary to have to drive all the way from Sanford every day because she can't find any place closer that's affordable for her to live. So for some of you, for a lot of you, it'll probably come down to just a sense of compassion and fairness. For me, there's something else as well, a sense of, of personal moral responsibility I enjoy the benefits that a growing, thriving metropolitan area have to offer me and my family. But I don't want those benefits to come at the expense of the least fortunate of my neighbors. And if my moving to this community and living in this community has been complicit in causing harm to others, I want to do what I can now to mitigate that harm. I don't believe in the heavenly judgment that our reading referenced this morning. The only heavens and hells I believe in are the ones that we create here on earth. But I know that throughout my life I will be subject to the judgment of my own moral conscience. And on the day that I move away from this community, I want to drive away thinking that I left this community better than I found it. That I made, made life better for the people who were already here. Not that I made it worse for them by making life so expensive that they had to move away. 
Now, some of you may think that I am overstating the connection between my own individual actions and the lives of some of my less fortunate neighbors, but I don't think I am. Somebody once said that every snowflake pleads not guilty in an avalanche. But the truth is that all of us who came here from someplace else are, to a degree, complicit in what's happening to some of our least fortunate, our less fortunate neighbors. So I ask this in the kindest, gentlest way possible. But what about the rest of you snowflakes? How do you want to be seen by the people who lived here before you arrived? What do you want to do about that now? We live in a nation now in which most decisions are made in the way that most decisions are made so that they benefit, benefit the people who are already the best off. Isn't that true? That's the way that most decisions get made in Washington, D.C. It's, it's the way most decisions get made over in our state capitol. That's how most decisions get made in Raleigh and Wake County. A better way to make decisions would be a more utilitarian one. And by that I mean, which decision is going to benefit the greatest number of people? Are more people going to benefit from doing something or not doing something? That would be a far better way of making decisions than what we're doing now. And if we lived in a real democracy, that's how decisions would get made. But I believe the best way, the best way of making decisions that affect us all would be to ask, what decision, what decision is going to benefit, what decision is going to bring the most benefit, what decision is going to bring the most benefit to the least fortunate among us? What's going to make life better for those who are now struggling the most, who are hurting the most? This approach is, this approach is often credited to the American political philosopher John Rawls. And it's the way that we would make decisions if we lived not only in a democratic country, but in a moral one. Of course, it wasn't just Rawls who said this. We learned from our reading. Jesus says, just as you did it to the one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. If that's what it meant to live in a Christian nation, I don't think I would mind living in one. Can you imagine, can you imagine what it would be like to live in such a country? It would be a country in which the more well-off would be asked to make small sacrifices for the less well-off, instead of the less well-off making big sacrifices for the more well-off, which is what is happening now. This doesn't have to be only a dream, my friends. This doesn't have to be only an idle fantasy. It can become our new reality if enough of us care, if enough of us dare to show up, to stand up, and to speak up for the world we want. We can turn the world around. So may it be. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is hymn number 1074, Turn the World Around. Alexandra and Linda are going to sing for us.
My friends, as we end this time of worship together, may we do so with ever more love for one another, with ever more gratitude for this precious gift we share among ourselves this day, with ever more peace in our hearts, and with ever more hope for our own lives in this world we share.